Hello you guys and welcome back to Life Journal with Miss GCH. I miss you all and I'm so happy to be back today for episode 3 of Saved, Single, and Left Behind. I did not forget about this series. I know you guys are like, where's the next video? It's right here. It's happening today. And I'm actually really excited about today's topic. It's inspired by some really cool people but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So let me say this. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, go back and watch. I actually have a playlist so far. It's only two videos that you've missed two episodes um, of the Save Single Left Behind series. Watch my like original testimony and like the story behind this all. That's the first episode and then I did a live, uh, not a live Q&A, child, no I did not do no live q and I did a Q&A <laughs> for episode two. Um, so make sure you go watch those two uh, and it'll kind of give you some context about like what I'm talking about here. But yes, so today we're talking about the good girl syndrome and my testimony with like virginity and the virginity vow and like the impact that that has made on my life. And this is actually inspired by um, Miss Kev Mrs. Kev on stage and Kev on stage. So most people typically know Kev on stage. Well, him and his wife had this podcast called The Love Hour Podcast. It was recommended to me by Tosh, one of my friends. Thank you, Tosh, because this podcast Saints of God. It's for, technically it's for married people. Like it's about, the topics around about like marriage and relationships. But you do not have to be married to listen to this podcast because it is so spot on. Like it has just been wrecking my whole world. And I feel like the main reason why is because Mrs. Kevin on stage and I, I'm convinced are twins. I think we had an identical childhood. I'm just homegirl and I when it comes to spirituality, virginity, relationships, to a certain extent, I feel like we are the same person. So let me give you some context. I was listening to the episode, it's called Sexual Exploration with Sexologist Shamira. So Sexologist Shamira is actually her um, Instagram tag for the guest speaker that they had on who is a sexologist. And so it's called Sexual Exploration. It was their Valentine's Day episode. Um, but surprisingly enough, I'm listening to this and Mrs. Cam on stage is talking about, her name is Melissa, so Liz is what they call her on there. And she was talking about her story basically with like sexuality. And she talked about this thing called the good girl syndrome. And I feel like this is a second time I've learned about a syndrome that I knew nothing about but I was living the full experience of that syndrome so I never knew about imposter syndrome and I'm in my counselor's office last year like talking about all these things and she was like have you heard of imposter syndrome and I was like no I have not and then I googled the definition and I was like what in my life it's all this all makes sense it's explained well good girl syndrome it's like another phenomenon that I was living and did not know that the actual terminology existed so I'm gonna read for you guys the definition of the good girl syndrome because yes it has a definition like that's how legit of an experience this is so I found this definition online just through I think it was like a blog post or something like that but the definition is pretty spot on. So they define the good girl syndrome as it says it encompasses the negative or unproductive thoughts, beliefs, attitudes, feelings, and behaviors that inhabit one's responsiveness and enjoyment of the sexual relationship in marriage. The good girl syndrome is often manifest as feelings of shame, guilt, embarrassment, or discomfort about sex, misinformation, distorted information, negative information, and a lack of positive education about sex and the body result not only in the previously mentioned emotions, but also in an inhibited sexual response. Well, can y'all just take that in? Like, can you just, just let that sit for a minute about what that really means? And how many of us girls who were raised in the church and raised in like really like faith-based households have experienced this or are experiencing this? Um, now I will say this, obviously I'm not married yet so I haven't tested the theory about like how this will impact my sexuality after I'm married. But I can hypothesize because I know how it's affecting, it's literally bleeding out into intimacy for me. Um, so it's not just sex, like, good girl syndrome, this definition really focuses on sex, but it's not just sex, it's intimacy, like being able to be on a deeper connection with someone in any kind of context of love, like, 
you know, not not just friends and family, although it can impact that too, but my ability or lack thereof to connect on an intimate level with a potential partner. Like, it's already having an impact. Like, I don't even have to wait for like the marriage bed to figure out if this thing has impacted me like this. And so this episode, Mrs. Kevin Sage, like I said, is talking about her testimony with him, but they're both just dropping her and sexologist Shamar and really Kev too, were all dropping these gems, y'all, about this good girl syndrome and how it's impacting us and how it's literally destroying. Like, Melissa talked about how for the first I forget what she said, like 10 years or something of their marriage, maybe maybe less, but something around that. For a very significant time, uh, at the beginning of their marriage, she struggled with being able to do like any type of sexual exploration, couldn't step outside of the box, really honestly felt bad and shameful about sex. I think we all don't realize that the messages that we um, engage in or tell ourselves or believe prior to marriage, they will carry over into marriage. So I actually have been seeing this meme around on social media talking about like um, marriage doesn't cure, was it lust? Or marriage doesn't cure infidelity something like that but like that makes sense if you're indulging in like lustful desires and you know you're indulging in all of that getting married or in infidelity even getting married won't suddenly make you faithful and won't suddenly make you not lustful but the opposite is true like in the context of what I'm talking about like if you're telling yourself sex is bad or so many people have told you sex is bad sex is bad no uh no sex no sex don't do sex shut sex down when you start to feel anything related to sex shut it down shut it off like literally put sex over there in a box lock it up and then suddenly when you get married and have like a potential partner now it's, the box is just supposed to come flying open and it's like it doesn't work like that like it doesn't work like that and also a lot of this is like my wrap-up notes I guess or like the notes that I was taking mentally while I was listening to the sexual exploration podcast because literally it's an hour and I think like 14 minutes and so much of that was just so good so I will be sharing kind of some of my notes from that but please go watch that episode like it is so worth the time it is available on like every outlet I think that you can listen to a podcast so you want to go listen to that episode but also I would subscribe to the love hour podcast like y'all it has not done me wrong yet like I love I love the podcast but anyways back to focus so let's start from the beginning so uh melissa mrs kevin stage talked about the impact of a virginity vow and while she's talking about that i'm like okay when did i make a virginity vow you know like when did i say i'll wait until marriage and honestly i don't i can't pinpoint like obviously the day and time or even the age i can't really remember like where did i first hear that and accept that but knowing myself and knowing that I like I was a rule follower that's another thing about like she and I were talking literally the way she describes her story is the way I describe my story like being a rule follower is my get down that's just how I was like following rules is great for me so anyways I'm pretty sure how I probably started the virginity vow was not from a personal dedication I'm sure it was somebody said you're supposed to be a virgin till marriage and I said okay here we go, virgin till marriage. That's what you're supposed to do? Okay, got it. No questions asked. Say no more, I got you. And so I'm sure that's how it started. And then I think as I got older, I kind of developed and made my own story for it, especially once I realized like, okay, doing it for other people, it might carry me till marriage just for like, okay, this is for other people. But you need to have a reason like why you're doing this. Like, Cause then how do I tell somebody else like oh yeah just be a virgin because like somebody else told me that that's what you're supposed to do like no like have a reason behind it so I know at some point it developed into chastity and I actually looked up that word because people throw around celibacy a lot instead of virginity or as a synonym of virginity and I'm always like what is the difference like what do those words mean but celibacy, at least based on the search that I came up with, actually means abstaining permanently from sex and marriage. And I'm like, that ain't what we doing. Because it was something like, you know, ministers in a certain religion or whatever, like sometimes they'll make a celibacy vow to abstain permanently. Whereas chastity is just abstaining from extramarital intercourse or sex. 
um and basically as a as a method of freedom not as a method of constraint but to just kind of be selective and wise about the way we're using our bodies in in sexual ways capacity is definitely the definition for me and i think at some point i developed that probably around like high school years or something like that but even in developing my own meaning around it it didn't cure the mindset of virginity and, and like sex is bad because there was never i can't pinpoint at any point a conversation that was had with me by church leaders by family by anyone that talked about what sex even was i can't even tell you when i learned what sex was I, I don't know what I do remember is that when kissing or anything related to like you know in movies like you can kind of tell when like two people are falling for each other or like you know if anything related to like kissing or intimacy or obviously sex came on the TV whether it was commercial TV show movie whatever it was we had to cover our eyes and it, it was kind of like a game I hope like I'm not the only church kid that like had to do this but like it was kind of like a game so it was like when something was coming up it was like you know cover your eyes like oh so our parents would like cover our eyes or if we were at the movie theater you know somebody would cover our eyes like parents eyes uncles whatever cover our eyes and then it was also like this ew you know like ooh, like and of course my parents were probably playing but at the same time when you're a kid especially and every time you see like associations are a real thing like not to go all psychology about this but like associations are a real thing so if i'm seeing if every time i see something related to sex relationships anything love intimacy i'm hearing ill i have to cover my eyes there's no explanation you feel me there's no why are we doing this it's just we don't look at that we're not looking at that ew. And so with that, I adopted that in my life, in my virginity vow. You know, ill to sex or ill to relationships or ill to like, that's that thing over there. Like I honestly used to feel shame about having crushes, about liking guys. Like I would keep it from my parents. I remember one time like building myself up, pumping myself up to tell my mom I had a crush on a guy and I was literally crying, like telling her about it. And she, she was like, why are you crying? I didn't know why I was crying, but it was just like, I'm crying because it feels like this is wrong or it feels like I shouldn't be having this. And it really blows my mind, you guys, that so many generations have survived on this method like on this like let's associate sex as bad let's make it bad let's make it horrible so that people won't do it in hopes that people won't do it obviously people <laughs> people still do it they do what they want to do it really blows my mind that we make that so awful and then at some mysterious point we assume that the switch is gonna flip and now these things are okay. The other thing that was mentioned on the podcast episode that I feel like I have to say is how once we learn that sex is not a bad, not actually a bad thing, that y'all were all just telling us that so that we would not do it. So then we learn it's actually a good thing and that God created us for sex and that the reason we have these desires is because he built us this way. Like we have actual sexual organs whose only role is to do sexual things. Like he literally made us this way. So we learned that it's good but it causes cognitive dissonance and although that's you know a little fancy psychology word it really just means that your truth or the truth that you believe for years is being challenged and it causes dissonance it causes tension for you so even though i know sex is good intimacy is good being in a relationship is actually a good thing all of these things are actually good okay but i can't turn off the switch i want to turn off the switch I think I want to turn off the switch but turning off the switch is uncomfortable because then that means I have to embrace a new ideology that I have never embraced like now I'm trying to tell myself this stuff is good but my core insights don't know if they believe that because they've always told themselves that it was bad and this cognitive dissonance is jacking folk up I praise God that I've discovered this now before I'm in a relationship or in a marriage like this stuff really hinders marriages or in my case it's also hindering relationships like y'all status update real quick i am failing my get out your comfort zone challenge the one that i mentioned in the first episode i 
I was talking about I'm trying to push myself outside of my comfort zone and do XYZ and like, you know, try to step out there. I'm failing. You know why? Because the things that I believed to get myself to this point and being sexually pure, like, it's comfortable. And you would think after all these years of not having a boyfriend, not having the opportunity to really engage in those, like, in, to even entertain this sexuality, this part of myself, that I would jump at the first viable opportunity. And I really thought so too, y'all. Like, and I think that is what people think when they train us is like, oh, when the time comes, they'll figure it out. When the time comes, the switch will turn off and they'll, and they'll, uh, you know, kind of jump into action. Let me be a living witness. No! Like, it's really crazy that we don't know what to do. We know what not to do. I can tell you all day what not to do how I was able to be a virgin until 25, all of the things that I pushed to the side and blacked out and, you know, tried to convince myself, you know, that I didn't have those feelings or that, you know, just whatever. All these lies that you tell yourself to get you to this point, we think it doesn't do any damage. It is damaging and it's damaging on so many levels and that's why I'm trying to get to this point of sexual positivity so that is the goal that is our aim goal for this whole discussion around the good girl syndrome sexual positivity and what does that mean I want to read um, a note that I wrote down that actually Miss Kevin Sage said here we go okay so she mentioned that it's not about sexual purity it's about sexual integrity Making sure that what you're doing sexually or relationship wise, intimacy wise, lines up with your beliefs. It's not about making the act bad because when you make the act bad, that's what leads to shame and guilt. And I'm like, that perspective would change so much about the conversation about sex in the church, especially around girls in the church. Like, can we just try that on for size? Like, instead of convincing all the girls that sex is horrible and sex is bad and, and you know, when you feel sexual urges, that's sexual temptation and that's wrong and that's a sin and, you know, all that stuff. Instead of doing that, maybe we just teach girls about like our bodies like what if we just gave that a try like what if we taught girls about what these organs are what they do what happens when you get these urges that you're not the only one that gets certain urges or that when your body feels those things that's because that's what those organs were made to do and it's not crazy you're not crazy you're not a sinner because your body is doing what it was made to do like feeling what it was made to feel like that's you're not crazy for having a crush like that's you're allowed to have those like that's actually normal helping girls come to their own definition of how they view their bodies and how they they want to keep their bodies like let us decide like y'all trying to get the message through to us by making us hate all of those things and kind of just push them to the back of our mind and almost pretend like they don't exist until it's time to use them. Whereas we can just have a really open conversation about like, why do people wait? Why would someone wait until marriage? What What are the benefits? What are the pros and cons of that? What would that look like for me individually? Like having real conversations about this stuff, about intimacy, just, I mean, just about I do want to share a little activity. The last thing I want to share is the the guest that they had on the show. So sexologist Shamira. I don't know why that is such a tongue twister for me. Sexologist Shamira. That's her Instagram handle, y'all. Her name is Shamira. But anyways, um, one thing that she suggested that she does with all of her clients is called sexual uh, sexual history. So she makes her clients go back and think about like. Um, you know, what are the messages that you received around sex, around intimacy, growing up? Where did those messages come from? Like, what what impact did those messages have on you? Like, she does that for each client and has them do it so that they can kind of come to terms with, like, what are these messages I've been telling myself? What does this mean for me now at this age, my current relationship, whatever? And so I've, I've been finding myself doing that really through this whole process of, you know, doing these episodes for Stay Single, Left Behind. But really now, because I just, I see it making such a huge impact and not a good one on my ability to like really stretch forth into intimate relationships. Like I just, y'all, 
Y'all just extend your hand toward me, okay? Put me on y'all's prayer wall if you have one, in your prayer journal, just in your prayers, whatever you have. Because you girl, you know, I've just been thinking lately, like, will I ever get over this hump? Like, you guys, I've literally been having conversations with myself about, like, is this even what I want? Like, am I so stuck in my ways and in my comfort zone that I, I could just stay here? You know what I'm saying? Like, like, do I, am I even sure I want a guy? Like, I can't even distinguish for myself between, like, mm, I'm not really feeling him or I really am feeling him and I'm just super scared to, like, step outside of my comfort zone. Like, what? I just, I don't know. I don't even know y'all. So I'm saying all this to y'all so that hopefully you intervene while it's still early. I'm not saying I'm old. It's still very early for me. Who knows what can happen in the future. But I'm trying to help all of you and I want you all to help the little women in your life, the little girls that are raised in the church that you know could be potentially receiving these messages. Like they were talking on the podcast about like, think about how early it might've been that we started receiving some of these messages four five years old like we don't have to convince girls that sex is bad in order for them to not do it and i say this for boys as well because i know sometimes church boys get that pressure too as well sometimes um so instead of going that route instead of saying ew every time someone's kissing on the television or having kids cover their eyes or all that stuff however you choose to deal with it it's fine but whatever you choose to do please make sure that it doesn't equate to something negative that it won't start this cycle of convincing us that sex is bad, that relationships are bad, that's for later in life, that the switch, you know, that the switch will flip when it's time. Let's just, can we let that go? Can we just, especially if you're a church leader, if you're a youth minister, you're a youth leader, sis, hear me, brother, hear me. Please, let's change the cycle. Like, I, I hope to have that opportunity if I do ever get over this this hump of my comfort zone and decide to let somebody in and maybe have kids or get married or something like that. Wow, if that ever happens. I hope to have this opportunity to change the narrative around sex. And unfortunately at this point, like they mentioned in the podcast, it is now part of my, what do they call it? Core programming. Can we be real about that? Like good girls becomes a part of your identity. Like Gaby, the good girl. I notice it when people talk about me sometimes. Like, oh, you're you're so pure is a word that I've gotten. Or like innocent. Like I told y'all in the first episode, innocent. Like people, it's like it's like a like they glorify that as part of my identity, and it's intense. And then the more people do that, you like really, you know, you really take that on, and you really like soak that in. And I don't want it. I want to let shame, guilt, fear, discomfort, all that around this topic and this subject. I want to let it go. So I'm going to do what I can to like work on that and we just go hope for the best y'all. So I just want to share with you my heart after listening to that episode. I've told so many people about it. I'm like, honestly, I should just make this my next episode with Stay Single and Left Behind. So I really hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you all so much for your feedback from the Q&A. Like, any messages that you've sent to me over the course of this series just to let me know that it's making an impact on you. I appreciate you so much. And I highlighted it in the one year video, but y'all, the first episode was used in a singles ministry. It was sent around to like a group chat of girls and like people are sending me the feedback from that and I'm like tripping. I'm just like, wow. Like this series and my testimony is clearly having an impact on you all. And that's all I can ask of all of this. So enough talking. I hope this episode is not too long for you. But if you enjoy it, please make sure that you subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you'll be the first to find out when I post another video. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up if you really enjoyed it so that I know the kind of content that you all are looking forward to. Make sure you leave me a comment. Maybe tell me about your experience with Good Girl Syndrome. If you know somebody with Good Girl Syndrome, any part of this chastity celibacy virginity whatever you want to talk to me about put it down in the comments sis i can't wait to read it y'all know i read and i reply to all of your comments so i look forward to the dialogue that will come out of this and i will see you guys in the next episode